Welcome to The Ruddle Show. I'm Lizette, and this is my dad, Cliff Ruddle. How are you doing today? I'm doing just great, and I'm really excited to be here with you. Yeah, we do have a very exciting show for you today. We have a special guest, Dr. Terry Pancuck. Lots of information to cover, so we're going to get started right away. It is with great pleasure that I have a good friend of mine, Dr. Terry Pancuck, with us here today. And uh, Terry and I go back uh, a lot of years, actually decades, and we have a lot of stories we could tell you. But I just wanted to have Terry on because he's a great friend, he's a consummate clinician, he's a teacher, he's a writer, and uh, maybe even a little inventing. So. We're going to talk about some of this today. Just see, he was a little surprised there. Maybe I wasn't supposed to say that he just invented the future. But anyway, um, I have a series of questions, and Terry's going to share a little glimpse of his life with us. So let's get started. Well, Terry, um, you're here with me today in Santa Barbara, but where were you born, and kind of how did it all get started? Well, I was born in Santa Monica. My father is an Iowa farmer. My mother is a Texan from El Paso. They met when my father went to uh, Fort Bliss for missile training school, mm -hmm. and they wanted to go to paradise. So they moved to L.A. like a lot of people did in the 50s, and um, they were a little disillusioned. It was a little bit bigger. My dad wanted to recreate Iowa, so he moved uh, north to Thousand Oaks, which was very rural in those days. And we had horses, chickens, and it was just a lot of open space. And he so was an engineer, job. right? He was an engineer. Aerospace. Aerospace. So probably for our audience, uh, back in this era, can we say that a lot of people came out to start uh, some of the big uh, space companies and aviation? And it was big in those days. Yeah, very, very good. good. Well, Terry, um, I think growing up you were probably playing some sports, right? Could you tell us a little bit about what the sports were and maybe... Uh, something that might have actually happened during sports that had nothing to do with sports that might have led to something else? Well, I love sports, and I was what you might call a hyperactive child. I was curious and adventurous and would take dares, and I played baseball, basketball, and, and later on golf. And um, my Little League coach, um, Dr. Ray Johnson, was a dentist and kind of my role model. And on Halloween night, around 1968, I got hit by a car, did a face plant, broke uh, both condyles, and knocked out my two front teeth, which were revulsed. And the technology in the 60s for replanting teeth wasn't what it was today, so I lost those teeth. And I lived in the dentist's office and had endodontics at a very early age. Wow. How old were you, roughly? Uh, Ten years old. And did your baseball coach, dentist, was he telling you things about what he was doing? Oh, yeah. And he, he, you know, he was a USC grad, very diligent, very much a perfectionist. I could tell when I went in there sometimes he was having good days and bad days because he was trying. Yeah. You know, he was very diligent and trying hard. And I can relate to that now, why he seemed like he's in different moods. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I thought, what a great environment. I always had great dental experience as a child, and it basically saved my face and my dentition, and so it was a big influence in my life. And there was even another episode of trauma, right? When I was about 18, again, being kind of aggressive and competitive in baseball, I was diving for a, you know, outfield fly, jumped, hit the crossbar of the chain link fence, and the dentistry that my parents had just paid for oh, uh, was, was on the ground. <laughs> And so uh, they weren't too happy, and so I had another cycle of dentistry and another cycle of root canal treatment on a few chip broken uh, lower incisors, in addition to a new bridge. And so I had endodontics um, 
as a personal experience at a very young age. You know, it's interesting. Uh, uh, I'm now talking to our audience uh, about this guy right here. Uh, when you hear these stories about hustle and extension and place, maybe we now understand more about Terry the end of Donna's because it's this tenacity and a lot of times that perseverance that uh, I have noticed and appreciated uh, as the professional. Okay, so moving on, uh, you played sports and you were growing up and you were in the dental chair as much as you were in the schoolroom. Yeah. Is what I'm thinking. Uh, probably so. Okay. And Took then, away from my education. Uh, well, college, what happened? Where'd you go? I went to UCLA undergrad and um, I had a lot of fun as an undergrad. I wasn't quite as studious at college as I was later on and that's where I met my wife, Diane. Well, when you were at UCLA, did you play any sports there, or was it all school? Well, I played a lot of intramural sports. I played basketball and uh, tag football, even though I wasn't supposed to. Um, I actually had a kidney removed when I was eight years old. Also, I had a congenitally mal malformed kidney, and I was told never to box, never to play um, football, but I loved tag football, and I'd do that anyway. Is this why only a few short years ago you were considering hang gliding? <laughs> yeah, I did hang gliding for a little while. And, uh, okay. But I've calmed down. I'm a little risk averse these days well, as I'm we, older. We're older. <laughs> okay, so you finished UCLA, but um, were you thinking dentistry because of your childhood experiences? I can't remember when I did not want to be a dentist. And it really? was kind of, I think your that's Your dream like, career? When I was young, I just really kind of idolized my um, baseball coach, my dentist, and I thought this would be a really cool thing to do, and I just kind of never wavered from wanting to be a dentist. And end being an endodontist came a little bit later, but um, dentistry How did you go was... To dental? What school and why? Well, I went to Georgetown really? because I was having so much fun at UCLA. Yeah. Um, it was one of the few schools that I was accepted at. <laughs> and it would happen to be the most expensive school in the country at the time. And so it wasn't on everybody's first choice, but it was a fantastic clinical program. We did a lot of restorative, a lot of surfaces of gold, very similar to USC at the time. What did Diane do back there while you were in dental school? Well, we were dating prior to my, you know, at the time I was being accepted to Georgetown. And so I said, honey, um, why don't we move to Georgetown together and move cross country? And she said, do I look stupid? <laughs> I said, You're, and so then I, so then I proposed to her okay. because she wasn't going to just move there. And so we got engaged and I, we got married at the Christmas vacation um, between my freshman year. Very cool. And then what did she do back there? Well, she had her sociology degree from UCLA and was very interested in business. Her father was a, an attorney, and so she got into George Washington, she got her MBA in procurement um, and contracts, and she actually got a job with the Air Force um, negotiating billion dollar um, contracts. It was very popular at that time, the main project was GPS, which was top secret, wow. and um, the Star Wars program that the Reagan administration was dealing with. Wow, that's cool. Well, you guys have, are a pretty impressive couple. Um, so you finish up dental school and what's in your mind? You, you gonna head back and start general practice or what, what was next? Well, I was influenced by Michael Fabio in the clinic at Georgetown. I was thinking... And became, who's Michael Fabio? He is a Boston University endodontist who was a teacher in the clinic ah. when I was at Georgetown. And I became interested in endodontics having had so much you know, experience with the procedure <laughs> on myself. And he said the only place to go is Boston University, you have to study under Herb Shielder. He is the guru. And so I looked into it. I was a member of the Ed Pinnock study group as a student at mm -hmm. Georgetown, and we'd go to the meetings. And um, I got accept. I, I had an interview at two schools, University of Penn and Boston University. And I'll never forget interviewing with Leif Tronstadt. He said, you know, I had pretty good scores on the DAT, and and had very good grades at Georgetown, a little different than UCLA undergrad. And he said, would you like to go into academia? And I go, hell no, I want to be a clinician. 
<laughs> yeah. And so I kind of negated you dive my, through my fences, options. Right. <laughs> and so the first question Herb asked me in my in my interview there was like, so where else did you apply? And I knew from all the students at the clinic, don't tell them you applied anywhere else. But I violated that rule. I said I applied to University of Penn. He said, oh, you did. And he said, what did? How did that go? I said, well, Dr. Tronstadt asked me if I wanted to go into academia, and I said, hell no. I want to be a clinician. He says, he went, that's right. <laughs> Isn't that <laughs> where he Herb went, though? Snort. Yeah. Because Herb, uh, Herb was, went to Temple. Oh, Temple. And was influenced heavily by Mort in Am Amsterdam. Was one of his mentors in Louis Grossman. And Grossman. So the whole pen, you know, academic. Restorative in the area. He was I knew he was doing him. more Amsterdam's uh, uh, endodontics. So yeah. I, knew, I knew he was doing oh, some yeah. tough cases. Well, when you were back in Boston, you know, I remember one time when Phyllis and I were back at uh, Boston, we went and spent a day. It was called the, A Day with Herb Shoulder. So we, he invited us to come back and spend a day. And you know what that's about. We won't even go into it. But anyway, we're back there, watched him a typical day in his life. And I'll never forget on his desk, he had several pictures of his residence. And he kept saying, look at those legs. Look at those legs. Those are legs. <laughs> and, you know, we're going like, yeah, those are legs, Herb. But, you know. Well, anyway, they all had something in common. They had running gear on, and they were runners who he had apparently convinced to run the marathon with him. So tell us, I think you got caught up in that. Well, I wanted to succeed and impress Herb. And even though I was asthmatic and one of the slowest base runners you could possibly have on a baseball team, I took He was a running. catcher on a baseball team. So, okay, go ahead. Catchers it doesn't require as much speed. <laughs> So I was a slow base runner, but, and I had asthma, and, but I go, I'm going to start running because I need to do this to be successful in Herb's eyes. And so I started running like half a mile around the block, and it would be very snowy. So since it wasn't very warm, it was, it was kind of easy on the lungs, the cold weather. So I go, oh, this is great. And then I moved it up to a, a mile a day in the mornings. And before I knew it, I was running like five miles a day. Then I was um, running like 10 miles, three days a week. Mm. And on the weekends, I do long, you know, longer runs mm -hmm. and really get what is called the proverbial runner's high. So I think the endorphins were starting to kick in. I actually started for the first time in my life enjoying running. And, Interesting. I, and then I started, and then I ran in the Cape Cod Marathon, actually finished it. And then um, I ran in the Boston Marathon, back of the pack. Didn't finish it the first year and then finish the Boston Marathon the second year that I ran. What did you so learn I, about running the marathon besides running? That it's exhausting. Yeah. <laughs> and you're beat up and it's a struggle. And the uphill was a lot easier than the downhill because of the long strides at the end. But it was, uh, it was quite an experience and the camaraderie was great. We ran, you know, a few of us ran together. And um, Herb would always cut out at the 16-mile point, and the rest of us would oh, go I know. on. Okay. But he was a serious runner, and his son was a fantastic uh, marathon runner and ran all the time, still probably runs to this day. Interesting. So you ran and got your certificate in endodontics. Yeah. And, of course, I'll tell the audience, uh, for the general dentist that maybe don't know this, at the time Terry trained, and when I trained, I went to Boston, but I was at Harvard, and my mentor was Al Krakow. That was Herb Schilder's second student. Teacher. But one thing that we liked about Boston is there was this philosophy of preparing canals, and uh, there was huge emphasis even back then. It wasn't called, it, Herb always said cleaning, but it could have been clean and disinfection today. Uh, and then filling root canal systems and warm gutta perch and all that. Yeah. So you just got baptized in that, and then you left. And were you going to stay back east, or were you going to, what, what, what was next? Well, my wife is a Southern California girl. Oh, right, you kidnapped her. <laughs> and I kidnapped her, and she wanted to go home. She, you know, the kidnapping period was over. Yeah. And so we moved back. She got a transfer from Hanscom Air Force Base in the Boston area to the Space Division down in uh, Newport Beach. And so we had our move paid for, and we moved down there. We lived in Culver City one year, and I worked in Thousand Oaks for six months. 
And then I migrated up to Santa Barbara. Thousand Oaks wasn't quite the sleepy little town that I grew up in. And, yeah. and so we moved further north, and Santa Barbara is beautiful, and that's where I've been ever since. Now, I'm going to separate Endo for just a second, and maybe I'll say a word or two and then say a sentence. Okay. Uh, horseback riding. Uh, you ever do any of that stuff? I grew up horseback riding. We had a horse. We had chickens. My father wanted to cre recreate Iowa in Thousand Oaks. It was a nice rural environment in those days, very similar to the San Inez Valley um, near us now. Um, and so, yeah, I used to go horseback riding, and, you know, we just, that was just part of my life. And my children don't really know much about that, but we, we took them on a ride, you know, several times, and they liked that. My wife also grew up horseback riding, so we do that a little bit. Not as much today as we did You know, uh, Terry, earlier. there's a sport that I don't know that a lot of the audience is going to know. Only your best friends would know. But you're a, you're a prolific golfer. And for a guy that practices endodontics full time and like long hour days, it's amazing. Uh, I don't even know if I got the right words, but you're close to a scratch golfer or something like that. Well, I was better earlier. When business is good, I'm a lousy golfer. And when business is bad, I'm a much better golfer because I can practice okay. <laughs> more. Well, uh, can you tell us two or three of the courses that were like bucket list type stuff? Well, the wonderful thing about golf is the camaraderie. And some of my best friends that I've had for years, we've gone on golf trips together, gone to Scotland, uh, you know, played the old courses in Carnoustie. Yeah. And one of our members at my club is a member of Augusta, took us all to Augusta, and I get uh, one of the few people, you know, that I know that can, you know, say they played Augusta four times. You want to tell us Cypress about Ray's, is it Ray's Corner or Ray's Creek? Ray's Creek, the Hogan Bridge, it's all just... You know, it's iconic. We have you, I think, on that bridge. Well, we'll yeah. show the audience. Well, what about uh, Pebble Beach and Spyglass? And... Pebble Beach, Cypress Point, uh, fantastic courses. But a lot of us, you know, I have a group of friends. We always try to play um, some great courses. And it's just a great experience, great bonding with your friends. Cool. You know, I never did golf, and I now refer it all out, and I refer it all to Terry. So Terry's my golfer. Okay. <laughs> well, did you... Um, uh, didn't you take a special cruise into Southeast uh, Asia and, and volcano country? Could you? That happened to be one of our um, golfing groups. Uh, yeah. A person contracted with Seaborne Cruise Lines in the 1980s for 1980s prices for a Millennium Cruise. And so there were 250 of us, and we um, cruised from Singapore to Bali and did all the Indonesian islands in that area over the millennium, and it was a very special treat to be anchored off the volcano Krakatoa on New Year's Eve in the millennium and watch the smoldering volcano and have a party, and it was just quite an experience, quite amazing excursions. We went to Komodo Island, got to see the Komodo dragons and some of the indigenous peoples in some of the islands like Lombok and Sumba, and it was that was a bucket list trip that I'll probably never do again that was amazing. Wonderful experience. I've been to the Southeast Asia and down through uh, that part of the world, and I can I imagine we could tell talk about that probably together for all afternoon. No, fantastic experience. I love Asia. It's you fish? Place. Love fishing. Okay. Don't get to do it as often as I'd like. Um, I'm not a great fly fisherman, but I like putting the line in the water, and and okay. and I love a, when a fish strikes your um, fly, and I'm very good at losing the fish off the line. Well, I have down here fishing, uh, you like boating, and we talked about running, golf, uh, we talked about, oh, mountains and snow, do you snowboard, ski, any of that stuff? Growing up, I didn't have a lot of opportunities to ski or be in the snow because we lived in Southern California, and my family, they weren't skiers, but later on in life, I tried skiing, and I realized because I surfed a lot that I was better at snowboarding, so I was... So I began snowboarding in the 40s and enjoyed that. And I haven't done that recently, but I was probably more of a snowboarder than skier because an average snowboarder looks a lot better on the snowboard than an average skier, <laughs> elegance-wise. Yeah. Well, you know, 
We've talked about several things uh, in recent days. We've hung out, talk about politics and AE stuff and ADA stuff. But I didn't do this to you on purpose, and this is a little curveball. So for our general dentist colleagues, um, they always want like a trick or a tip or something that will ma add meaning to their life. Or maybe some little tiny thing like as simple as like isolate the tooth. Yeah. So can you give us three, three tips, maybe in a sentence each one, and then of course they can follow up with you. Well, on the next segment, we'll talk to you about your educational center and how they can even get tapped into you more. But right now, you have like three little tricks for our general dentist and in the dentist. I mean, in dentist sometimes can benefit. I would say the key to treating simple cases and complex cases is one, having immaculate isolation with the rubber dam. Spend time to make sure the rubber dam fits and seals so saliva isn't seeping through. Um, do whatever it takes to get good access. If you have to prescribe Xanax to relax the muscles, place a bite block, um, access is everything, and then actually spend a lot of time on the access cavity prep so that you have direct lines, no ledges. Um, the time you spend refining the access pays huge dividends later in the case. And so those would be my three tips. Those are excellent tips because, you know, if you're working through a good spacious access cavity, not too big, not too small, just right, uh, everything falls with greater predictability. Exactly. And okay. you know that more than anyone, Cliff. Uh, well, I did a couple accesses, I recall. One was <laughs> out the did. side of the route and one was I through the floor. So. But we'll, you'll help me on that later. Um, okay, we, we, I told you about a little story about uh, Phyllis and me in the special course we went to and you said I'm a guy that lives right now so I had a question here what do you want to be remembered for uh, maybe uh, I don't want to say you're gone because I've lost too many people in the last three yeah. months but assuming you're gonna live good. for a thousand more years what would you like to have uh, the world of endodontics or your family remember you as well I struggled over that question when you asked me that and because I don't think I ever think of being remembered. I live pretty much in the now, and I'm focused on the now, thinking about what is the right appropriate thing for me to be doing right at this moment. And there are a lot of ambitious climbers trying to climb the summit of Everest, and they're now frozen corpse waypoints. And I don't want to be remembered as a waypoint for those in the future that want to summit Everest. I you know, just hope that I'm creating paths for people and with my friends and my colleagues where we're all kind of sharing the same journey together and I don't really look in the rearview mirror to the past that much although I certainly respect people like Herb Shielder and have been influenced by great mentors we learn from history but as far as how I want to be remembered I'm not looking at my past my wife makes fun of me because she said you don't remember when we did this <laughs> Sometimes my past is just a blur to me, maybe old age, but I think um, I'm just focused on now. Don't really think about being remembered. I hope my sons, my gene pool carries on and they have a wonderful you know, life and success. And um, I'm a spiritual person. I believe in, you know, there's something else. And I just believe that this journey will continue on. And what I do here is for now, and for others that are making that journey, and we'll just keep moving forward into the future. Thanks, Terry. Okay, so I hope you've really enjoyed getting a little glimpse of this guy. You know, he's my personal endodontist. He's uh, helped me out. Uh, my daughter, Lizette, you've helped her out on three teeth. Um, two of them were bicuspid teeth, and they were, they had a lot of root curvature, forget canal curvature. Yeah, I was sweating bullets on that one. <laughs> yeah, she had bad head shape roots. And then, of course, my daughter got into trouble on another tooth when I don't think you were available. You were out of town, probably lecturing, and went to another endodontist. And, you know, I have all the technology in the world, but I want the audience to know um, a lot of the technology is an adjunct to good, solid thinking, uh, being very precise in how you approach your work. So this is Terry Pancock. And um, I hope you've enjoyed our time together, and we're going to talk to him a little bit more in the next segment. So right now, let's take a little break, and thanks so much, Terry. Thanks, Cliff. You it's a pleasure you. being here, an honor. Thank you.
was a great interview. I really enjoyed learning a little bit about your journey and getting a glimpse into your life. So today we want now to talk about the present state of dentistry and endodontics in particular. Obviously, technology has greatly evolved over the years and techniques have changed, but we really want to focus today on how endodontic education has evolved. So can you start by telling us a little bit about your um, educational company, Pure Dental Learning? Pure Dental Learning was basically my attempt to just combine academicians, students, and clinicians together in it to having an interactive educational experience. And it evolved as kind of an endodontic library of case studies. And then we also have webinars that are fully interactive. So we try to encourage the people that participate in these online webinars to interrupt the speakers, ask some challenging questions, um, no holds bar, and the interactive element of these all these venues. And at some point, maybe we'll make an endodontic encyclopedia that you know people contribute enough cases and we get good literature references. Um, I think we have some slides that show a little bit more about the philosophy behind the company or the education that that you how you see it. So why don't you just explain to us a little bit more what this graphic means? Well, I like to think in terms of Venn diagrams, and everybody has their own bias and perspective. And a clinician tends, once you graduate from dental school, they don't always, we don't always read the literature to the same diligence that we did when we were studying. Mm -hmm. And you tend to believe that what you see, what works in your hands is the way it is. If you see it, you believe it. So your version or your bias of how you perceive the truth is empirical, what you see in your practice with less literature support. And then sometimes you might have a harebrained idea that you think, hey, this would be a good thing to try. And your creativity, which isn't always appropriate, may come into play as theory to um, contribute to what your perception of the truth is. And I think that you're required to have some CE, but maybe you just do that to get it out of the way and you're really just focused on your practice and a lot of times dentists will go to CE courses as a, you know, as a golf trip. <laughs> you know, where okay. they'll show up and get their CE credits and then get the get the course code and then go play golf. But you know, what I really like about PDLs, we have a lot of residents, we have a lot of um, students that are very passionate, very enthusiastic, and that's very fulfilling. It's very enriching to have people that are very passionate, learning, asking questions, and we kind of, that kind of kind of rubs off on some of the clinicians that may become a little jaded, where they see these excited young, you know, oh, young people. I would think that would be the you know case. being excited, and it brings everybody together, and a little bit more excitement comes to learning. You find that when you're teaching, right? That the excitement of the students, because I know you work with a lot of residents, probably like renews your excitement as well. You know, having the chance to help somebody in life, whether it's a patient or whether it's a student that is sincere and wants to learn, it's one of the biggest joys that Terry and I would get out of teaching because you see uh, the aha moment and the lights go on. Then maybe by the end of the day, they're showing you images that they've done and they're they're getting it and it brings us a lot of joy, right, Terry? Keeps you fresh, keeps you enthused. And you know, we do this and we don't always get paid for our time out of the office, but it comes back in spades because you come back refreshed and you're just more successful in your life overall because of just having this energy that you keep infusing into your practice. You know, Terry, one thing I, I don't think we thought we were gonna talk about this, but don't don't you think from a teaching perspective, it's so healthy because every single case you're thinking, this needs to be fully documented. Exactly. I don't know what I'm gonna discover here, but it's gonna be maybe something that I'll see once in my life. Exactly, and I don't think I documented as well earlier in my career, mainly because of technology. We didn't have digital imaging and all the cameras that we have today available. And it was a big deal to you know have a film camera and remember which cases were on the roll and organize that later. Yeah. So my early case in my career, not you know probably the same for you, are not as well documented as later in your career, where it's just easier to document. So I, I just snap pictures of everything when I'm working now and just filter it out later. Let's take a look at the next slide where we show the academician's perspective. 
Well, there's always this with <laughs> academicians and clinicians where they just don't have an appreciation for each other many times. And the academician, the person that's at a school, probably doesn't have as much clinical import into their knowledge base as a clinician, but they're guilty of not having the clinical experience in the same way the clinician's guilty of not having, keeping up with the literature. Mm. And so they believe that the literature is a holy grail of evidence and they think that that comprises of the tooth, of the, excuse me, of the truth. And so really, you know, that's another bias. That's another false mm -hmm. perspective. We think the truth is more, you know, more based on our bias. It's interesting that the initial, like, a reaction is for them to be kind of opposed to each other instead of like wanting to bring all their knowledge together. Well, that's the way it should be. It should be a balance of all perspectives. We should bring all the knowledge together so that we can all learn from each other. So let's look at the reality. Okay, so here, explain a little bit about this. What well, I think the reality is that we don't understand the truth as well as we think we do. Like and so neither even, side. Neither side. And so we're always coming up with surprises in science. We're always changing the paradigm in science. Uh, things change, evolve, and things we believe one year may be different the next year as more evidence comes out. So really, if we share our knowledge, share the empiricism, share creativity theory, and keep up with the literature, and most importantly, critically evaluate it so you can weed out with intelligence the false literature that's not designed very well, um, that'll give you the best appreciation of the truth. Now these interactions or intersections of the, these circles in the Venn diagram are arbitrary. And so it's just kind of my, my bias perspective, what I think you know each contributes to the truth. But I think we can, we can pretty much say we're, none of us are perfect or understand I do notice knowledge. about your diagram is that they participate in the truth, but they don't just all encompass the truth. So maybe that's because we're all subjective human beings. So even if we read the research and even if we're doing um, practice and talking to students, we still can only approach the truth. We can only approach the truth. And it's a constant battle. We're trying perfection. We need to have 100% focus, 100% planning. And, you know, but we're still not perfect. We're all human beings. And so we, shared knowledge is more powerful than individual knowledge. I really like, so you're just emphasizing shared knowledge and um, not just focusing in one area, but getting your knowledge from different places. Absolutely. And that's the beauty of interdisciplinary <clears throat> care. We as endodontists sometimes have tunnel vision into a canal and into a tooth. But until we start working with the orthodontist, the oral surgeons, the periodontist, and the prosthodontist, restorative dentist, um, we get a better feeling of like how important this tooth is, what our roles should really be in the overall treatment plan. And that's, that's the beauty of interdisciplinary dental care. It's the best high quality care a patient can receive. So I'd like to pound on this one more time. So, you know, Terry's talking about interdisciplinary treatment and study clubs comes to mind. Um, I want to tell one on him. We hadn't thought about saying this, but he was gone last week out of Santa Barbara. He's in the greater Phoenix area, and apparently the Seattle Study Club. I might have this wrong, so you don't have to even correct me, but there was groups from around the country, and I think there were six teams. So 18 teams cut down to six, cut oh. down to two, cut oh. down to one. Okay. And so it was fun being on that team, just the collaboration with other specialists. It's a fantastic experience to be involved in study clubs, I think. What I wanted them to hear though, Terry, is you went down there with a maxillofacial surgeon. Yep. You went down there, I think, with an orthodontist, the prosthodontist, you were the endodontist. And the thing is, by everybody sharing the case through their perspective and their frame of reference, you begin to find, as we've been talking about, the edges of the truth, and they begin to show up. So they went from a great number of people from around the country, and your team is down to the final two? Final six. Final six. But the audience voted. <laughs> oh, okay. On <laughs> the second round. But, the experts voted you know, the first round. I'm about two generations okay. older than Terry, but when I first came to town, I joined a study club that was, uh, there was 10 of us. 
and we met every six times a year, six uh, once a month, six times a year, and we had all these disciplines, and everybody just throw up the case, and we'd all talk about it. But you begin to discover those things and how they all interrelate. Maybe we could have Isaac find the area of commonality. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and it yeah. might be yeah. just a little football right yeah. in that green blue area. <laughs> but the more you work together, the more that commonality merges. And so I very think, good. Uh, that's very important. What else do you got for us? Well, why does it, why don't you tell us more about the webinars and how you see those as being like how how you see them as they should be run versus other ones you've seen that you try to make yours different from? Well, I think what PDL is different and what way PDL is different is that we try to be as interactive as possible and we don't try to control the narrative of the presentation. So we want everything to be challenged and we want everything to be shared and so that everybody has a chance to answer questions. Can I cut in? So I was a moderator a couple times when you were doing live demos. And one was a, can we just say a shape clean pack on a maxillary second molar? Yes. And then the other one was a, a microsurgery procedure on a root approximation to the mental foramen, mandibular by. And what I wanted to tell the room is, I'm a moderator, right? So I'm supposed to take pressure off of Terry. I'm supposed to like, he's working, right? He's the surgeon in this case. Um, he has his earphones on and he's taking questions from around the country and he's doing his bevel. <laughs> he's working on his apicoectomy. And remember we kept beveling, beveling because there's a little micro fracture. Anyway, yes. long story short is this guy, I think we'd call him a one man band. <laughs> he, yeah. he had your assistant and you had a patient, but you were like inbound, outbound, <laughs> and you were doing the work. It was a beautiful yeah, it was experience. a little bit of a show and, you know, but the patient was carefully selected and we basically selected the situation so that it could be maximally interactive and a lot of problems with a lot of live stream is there's a lot of dead time and we didn't want that we wanted questions being asked we had people at the conference table live we had yourself asking you know questions as a moderator and we had online people feeding me questions through the headphones Jerry Vulcan was there yeah your yeah. old pal oh, or yeah, pal. my pal yeah and so I think you know if you choose the right case that can be a max that can be a powerful learning experience for people where questions come out it it's not a controlled environment the procedure will happen and anything unusual that happens can be picked apart discussed for maximum learning at that point and that's Perfect. the whole goal of PDL. You had told me something that I thought was interesting because I'd heard my dad say in the past that he's seen a webinar that just went horribly wrong and just kind of ended in like you're just cringing and it's sort of a disaster. But then you had mentioned that you actually want things to go wrong because then you can have a chance to. Why don't you tell us about that? Well, I don't know if I want it to go wrong, <laughs> but I don't mind controllable complexities that are unplanned occurring because that's where the real learning occurs. And I think everybody wants to see, you know, they, they don't want to see a pristine routine case that there's no learning. They want to see a case with complexities and they want to see how somebody with experience handles that. And that's how they learn. And they want to have a chance to ask like, why did you do that? Like they'll go like right then and there. And you don't want to have to think two hours later, like, you know, like I forgot the question. They want to ask questions immediately, like when something, like, why are you doing that? And so patient, you know, the participants in these webinars have the opportunity to ask immediate real-time questions, which is kind of unique in today's, um, you know, dental education setting. See, that chaos is very different than the chaos he's describing. He's describing a clinician who has to make decisions by the moment. And when you're doing microsurgery, even with CVCT and all of his pretreatment planning, there's a lot of things that come up, bleeders, you know, everything that you wouldn't expect necessarily can happen. And of course, with a lot of experience, you start to say, I saw it all until he didn't. So that to me, chaotic, that's uh, control chaos. I, my complaint is the ones that are showing and not teaching. I wanna make a critical distinction between show and teach. Show is a lot of times a new technology. Well, we all love technology, so it's okay to show new technology, but the technology is an adjunct. 
It's not, it should not be there to cover up deficiencies in, in primary training. So when I saw chaos, I saw using new technology, bleeding problems, uh, cutrol going down the canal, coagulation left behind, and packing a few minutes later. So to me, it, it was more showing than it was telling or, or teaching and instruction. Yeah, that's not complexity management, that's crisis management, <laughs> <laughs> unnecessary crises. <laughs> yeah. And so that, you know, that's, that's not what we want to show. We want to show, you know, proper planning, proper selection of the patient for that venue, and the way the case is really managed by somebody with experience. You know, Terry, many years ago, and I told this on another show already, so I won't repeat it. Sorry, I don't want to bore you to death. But the Air Force has an expression, flawless execution. So I was eating with these officers that fly the F-18s and F-22s, and they're like half your age. And I said, God, you never, no mistakes ever? They said, oh, no, we make lots of mistakes. But he said, we're always adjusting and we're always solving problems as they occur. So that's what you were doing when I saw surgery. Well, a crisis mistake in that instance would be a crash and death. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and management of complexities means you're still flying and you're fine. So <laughs> not so bad. <laughs> not so bad. <laughs> okay, let's move on and talk a little bit about um, the discussion forums that are out there. Why don't you tell us about the different kinds of endodontic discussion forums that are out there? Are there any that you prefer or do you participate in them? I try to participate in as many discussion forums as Stop. I possibly he, can. He's internationally famous, so everybody listen very carefully <laughs> about discussion. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I love discussion forums. It's an opportunity to challenge and debate. And I'm a big fan of Socratic debate, which isn't always politically correct or popular these days. And uh, to just have a pool of people all sharing the same profession, having different experiences, and to challenge ideas is a wonderful learning experience for me to learn more from other people and to have my own ideas tested. I think that is critical. So you, you like the feedback, fantastic. don't you? Love the feedback. And you know one thing Terry does, and I think he's sometimes misunderstood, but sometimes when we attack a philosophy or a treatment or a, a, a thinking decision, we're not attacking the person. We're trying to get better with the procedure. And that's where uh, colleagues need to be able to hold two conflicting ideas at one time. That's called maturity. When you can hold two ideas, like maybe he's not attacking me. He, he wondered why I had bleeding. I was still stuffing something in the retro prep and there was blood everywhere. So then I get, I can take it wrong. I can get angry about it. He's attacking me. Now Terry wants to know it. He's, you know, we just lost Kobe Bryant. Yeah. And I read something last night in the paper, and I've heard you say it three times today, and we haven't even talked about it. He said that after he left the game, the most important thing that would be if he would work with you and train with you and work out one on one was if you were curious. You've mentioned that word curiosity three times. I think sometimes great people are curious about things and that's what makes them try to discover the truth or the edges of the truth. Yeah, I've always been curious and um, sometimes too curious, uh, probing in areas that people don't want to answer the question. <laughs> and uh, and so that's, um, that's, that's a very interesting thought. Yeah, I think it's very important to be curious. And Keeps it if interesting. somebody is different, it's even more intriguing to find out how they Quite. are different than what how you are. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that like three pretty hot topics right now in discussion. Oh, forums geez, hot topics, are Terry. Probably minimally invasive endodontics, gentle wave, and obturation with a single cone and BC sealer. So, why don't we give each of you an opportunity to speak, just uncensored for one minute about gentle wave first. So who wants, do you want to start? Let, let our guests go first. You oh, you're going to put me on the spot. On and I'll time you. Then I'll be, I'll be saying okay. how, uh, how truthful I want to be with my responses. <laughs> I, so I, one minute, start now. Okay. I am receptive to all technology and new technology, but in order to incorporate it into my practice and actually use it on patients and have a degree of confidence, I either have to have my own logic satisfied mm -hmm. And there has to be adequate scientific evidence. And the problem with Gentle Wave and the Sonindo Corporate, they're very aggressive. 
They're trying to set this device up as a new standard of care, which I disagree with, because they really don't have the science to back it up. They have science, but they require universities and anybody who buys their device to sign a contract, and so they kind of shoehorn their employees in to control the data, control the results, which is not independent research. So there are no real citations out there on the general wave device that are unbiased and actual third-party research. Time, perfect. Okay. <laughs> Whoops. Okay. <laughs> now you go, Dad. Oh, well, I want to be kind and I'm going to be honest. Uh, Terry will know that your pop believes in root canal systems because we were all trained in Boston. He went to BU. That's the guy, Schilder, who pretty much mapped this out for us in terms of the anatomy, the breakdown, the disease flow, and what the assignment was. And he invented all kinds of words and vernacular, and a few people, a very few people, embraced that. So I was a couple generations before him. I came back to Santa Barbara and I was filling root canal systems. So the first thing I'd like to say to both of you, and you'll agree, I think, I've been getting anatomy off of every shape canal, two or three POEs off of virtually every shape on an average for decades. I never used General Wave. So I get insulted when the impression is finally for the first time in your life, doctor, you'll be able to treat a root canal system because we have a system. So I didn't say very much. See, she's really telling me to be I quiet. Know, I do this have, is a pesky uh, alarm. By the way, Isaac, I do have the sound off. So. <laughs> so I guess I'll just finish by saying lots more will be coming. Many episodes will return to this topic because it's like the news. Sometimes the news doesn't play out in one cycle. We're going to hear it for a few weeks. We're just getting started with Gentle Wave. We're just getting okay. started. So now in the interest of time, I'll let you have one more minute on either minimally invasive endodontics or BC sealer and single cone obturation. Which one do you choose? I'll pick minimally invasive endodontics. Okay, and go. Okay, minimally invasive endodontics is a great concept in the sense that we want to conserve dentin and not remove any unnecessary dentin. Um, I think of endodontic access as a C-axis, which I call strategically extended endodontic axis. You don't want to remove dentin where you don't need to, but you have to remove dentin to get a direct line to the canal and remove clean shape and eliminate debris. And if you don't do that, it's like having a small opening. The debris is just going to churn in a container and not be removed unless you can actually flush it out through an adequate occlusal opening. And the occlusal third of the crown is very expendable to structure because that preserves your ferrule at the cervical area where you can have a restoration and still have an adequate restoration with a tooth having structural integrity. So that's it. Okay. I'll finish early. And now what would you like to talk about? Um, well, I'll just repeat a joke. Well, I mean, you can pick one minute on either oh. invasive endodontics or... Oh, I'll take the single cone okay. and the VC sealer. Um, obviously, a lot of this has arrived because of the triad. We prepare the canal. We don't agree on the uh, terminal diameter of the taper. Uh, cleansing, there's all kinds of methods, chemicals and agitation devices, and then, of course, filling root canal systems. So as we change any one of those in the model, we change the others. So as the shapes have gotten smaller, they can't get the armamentarium sufficiently deep to mold the cone and adapt it into the apical configuration. And so I think I don't like like the cold cone, but the most important thing I don't like is a sealer that is immiscible in any chemical and cannot be completely removed mechanically. And I wonder when I talk to people like uh, Josiette Camilleri, a world authority in BC sealer, what we're going to see in three, four, five years. Terry will tell you almost anything works for three, four, five years. And what separates out excellence from mediocrity is time. And time. Okay, so I the, thank you both. I think that we really appreciate to hear your just candid opinions on those things. Thanks, Terry. Um, thank you, you. It's an honor to be here today. I, I just want you to finish by maybe telling us how you see the future of endodontic education. Well, I'm an optimist. 
and an extreme optimist. I believe that one person can change things. And one problem we have in education today is bias and corporate bias, influencing the narrative of education and distorting the truth that we talked about earlier. So I think in the future, we have to balance this out better. We need technology, we need innovation, but we also need to have fair, non-fraudulent science and education. We can't have every uh, corporate employee shoehorned into these programs creating what is being taught and what's, you know, what the curriculum is. We have to be teaching more diagnosis and treatment planning, things that are not tied to a product. And so I see the future is balancing this better. And I think those of us who are passionate about education and want a balanced education can push this forward and we can change. The pendulum swings back and forth. It, you know, you know, there were probably two prudential in the past and now we're, we're provincial in the past. And we're now to uh, wild west with, you know, just free, free associated influences. Cowboy in the Donnick. Cowboy in the Donnick. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to get back to a balance and have, you know, it, and students and clinicians will be better in the future for it. Well, thank you. Thank you both. I think that um, pretty much is a bit, we're out of time now, but I do think that, um, well, I forgot what I was going to say, but I really, I'm actually very inspired by your passion. So thank you for coming on the show today and thank you both. Thank you, Cliff. Thanks, Lisa. Thank Thanks, something. Terry. We'll have you back because you have a lot to give. We'll have to get you over there on set B, you know, so you can get up there and do a little teaching on the chalkboard. Oh, wait. Um, we, do, we, we do have some cases that Dr. Pancock has done on our website in the show notes. Mm, yes. So um, you, if you want to look at some great endodontics, please feel free to go there. And visit Pure Dental Learning. Yes. Okay, so we're going to close our show today with a segment we call Good News, Bad News. And is what's going to happen is I'm going to name a product or a concept, and then my dad is going to tell you the good news about it and the bad news about it. But he's going to be very concise. So just so you know, we might talk in a lot more detail on a future show about some of these things. But just to close this segment, it's going to be pretty concise, the good news and then the bad news. So here we go. Cheap files. The good news is they're cheap. <laughs> the bad news is they unwind and you replace them frequently. System-based endodontics. The good news for system-based is that it's a concept where files got to purchase of paper points all have some interrelationship with each other. The bad news is most companies haven't discovered how to actually deliver it. So kind of like a theoretically and then a reality. <laughs> yeah. Gentle wave. Uh, intriguing that it can probably clean quite well. Bad news is that we could already clean quite well. Technology in general. The good news is it holds enormous promise to be either easier, better, faster. Bad news is a lot of people uh, pass on training and hope the magic technology can overcome the deficiencies in training. Minimally invasive endodontics. Noble concept is the good news. The bad news is we argue about something about the size of a human hair. Online education. Oh, the good news is it's accessible. It's uh, easy for clients uh, in, in their own world. Uh, bad news is be sure you know who you're training with. And also there's something good, uh, there's something positive about getting out in the community and interacting, like Terry was talking about the importance of dialogue, it seems like you lose a little bit of that with online education. You know, there's still nothing like a hug and a handshake and sitting by somebody during a study club and visiting about a case why there's a break. You learn a lot physically getting together. Okay, BC Sealer. The good news is it's a good repair material. It's in that silicate uh, family of like MTA. Bad news is, um, we have to worry about solubility, we have to worry about pH, and we have to worry about degradation. And we don't know that yet. And lastly, the Ruddle Show. 
The good news is I'm sitting right here about 100 yards from my house. <laughs> uh, the bad news is staying on time. <laughs> yes. And with that in mind, we are out of time for today. So thank you for watching and we hope you enjoyed it. See you next time on The Rebel Show.